it's time for another edition of the Collector's Corner. Aloha, and welcome to another edition of the Collector's Corner, brought to you by our friends at the Sadistic Penguin Studio. I am your host, the man of questionable character, Aloha, Mr. Hand, and today my focus is on one particular day. October 15th, 1988. I know some of you who are watching this probably were not even alive then. I was. Uh, let's just say I wasn't legal, but I enjoyed myself. Um, so October 15th, 1988 was a Saturday. And just a little history of myself. The night before October 14th, 1988, I went and saw Def Leppard. At the Rosemont Horizon. That was when they were on their Hysteria tour. So the weekend had already started off with a bang, so to speak. And there were two significant events that happened on October 15th that I have memorabilia for. And I want to explain each one of them. The first happened in the afternoon. And like I said, it was a Saturday. So what are Saturdays? College football. Now... This is probably one of the most famous college football games of all time. As a matter of fact, it has a nickname. And you have to understand the events leading up to this game. This was a battle of number one versus number three. The teams I will not name yet. And there was some significant... Uh, activities going on outside of the game where people found money-making opportunities and one of these money-making opportunities led to this game's name. Now I could tell you who the opponents were but when I tell you the name of the game you will know because it's legendary. It even had a 30 for 30 made about it and the title of the game and the title of the 30 for 30 is Catholics versus convicts that's right on october 15th 1988 was the legendary miami hurricanes versus notre dame fighting irish game notre dame winning 31 to 30 the reason this game is so historic is not only the battle of the rankings of the teams and the bad blood between them jimmy johnson was the coach of the miami hurricanes at the time but i just had to throw that in but also because during the week leading up to this, there was a lot of buzz, obviously. Being in Chicago, there was also a different kind of buzz. And that was from some products that were being made and distributed and sold. And I admit, I had one. Uh, obviously, it would never fit me now, and I really don't know what happened to it, to be completely honest. Uh, but there were... Catholics versus convict shirts everywhere. And that's what this game became known as. Now, the game is available on YouTube, and you can watch it. And you can hear Brent Mus Musburger talking about the Catholic versus convict t-shirt. And if memory serves, he actually showed one on the broadcast. Now, this was the hottest item, in, obviously, in South Bend. But also in Chicago, this item was huge. Everybody wanted one. I did find one. I did have one for a while. Like I said, I probably fattened myself out of it, and who knows what happened to it, but whatever. But yes, today was, October 15th, was the Catholics versus Convicts football game. See right there, even it's recognized by PSA. Catholics versus Convicts. It was an amazing game to watch. It really was. And this was just the primer, if you will. As hard as that is to believe was the primer because after the game ended, which was at the time on CBS, Notre Dame had not signed their agreement with NBC yet. It was on CBS. That's why you got Brent Musburger there. After this game ended, you switched over to NBC. And on NBC was game one of the 1988 World Series. Now, this game is legendary for what happened in it. But, just to give you a little history, tell me if you've heard this NLCS matchup 
recently. It was the Dodgers and the Mets for the National League pennant, with the Dodgers winning it in seven thrilling games. In the course of that series, a key player for the Dodgers got injured, uh, a gentleman by the name of Kirk Gibson. More about him later. The Oakland A's were the opponents in the World Series, and they had just steamrolled through the season, swept the Boston Red Sox in the playoffs, Dennis Eckersley being the ALCS MVP that year. We'll get to him later, too. So you had this, this battle of David versus Goliath. Not only that, the Dodgers were were... Not favored to beat the Mets. The Mets were the favorites going into that series. They were still the, the you know, the to use a basketball term, the bad boy Mets with the Dykstras and, and you know, the players of that. Oh, Keith Hernandez was still there, Gary Carter, Ron Darling. You still had that 86 core that was there uh, in 88. But the Dodgers were able to win the series in seven games, which is a weird dynamic because look at it now. The Dodgers are the, the juggernaut, if you will, in the National League. And the Mets, you know, lower seed, wild card, working their way up, basically get the home run on the the, the, uh, the doubleheader makeup against the Braves to win the first game and clinch a playoff spot, and then get the home run by Alonzo in the ninth inning of Game 3 against the Brewers to win that series, and then taking care of business against the heavily favored Phillies. So now you have the Mets as the underdog and the Dodgers as the overwhelming favorite in this year's uh, NLCS. But it was it was completely flip-flopped back in 1988. And remember, they only played uh, ALCS World Series. There was no division series or any of that stuff. It was two divisions each league, and it was basically the Red Sox and the A's winning the divisions in the AL. And in the NL, it was the Dodgers and the Mets. So, we set the stage now. Notre Dame has pulled out the 31-30 victory against Miami on the last play of the game where Miami went for two since they were the number one team. They went for two to win the game. They didn't want to tie. They wanted to win. Notre Dame was able to defend the pass in the end zone. Game over. So you switch to the night, as I said. The Notre Dame game on CBS... The World Series on NBC. Vince Scully on the call. And the game started out interesting because in the first inning, Mickey Hatcher hits a two-run homer off of Dave Stewart to give the Dodgers a 2 to nothing lead. In the second inning, or is it the third? Maybe the third. I want to say that Jose Canseco hits a grand slam to dead center where it actually hits the TV camera. If you watch the video replay of that homer, you'll see it hit the TV camera in dead center. And by the way, the next day, Canseco did go out and autograph that camera. That's a side note to what eventually happened. So we get to the Dodgers squeak out another run. So we get to the bottom of the ninth. And Eckersley comes out of the bullpen. Now, Eckersley had basically been lights out all year long. Eckersley gets the first two outs. And then he walks, I want to say Davis, he walked. Which Tommy Lasorda runs, you know, throws the dice and gambles. Now, they had talked during the game about how Kirk Gibson was out. He would not be playing. He was not available. He could hardly walk for that matter. He was not available. All of a sudden, you see Gibson come out of the dugout and Dodger Stadium erupted. Kirk Gibson was the NL MVP that year, and he was incredibly deserving of it. Numbers do not tell the story of what Kirk Gibson did for that team, and I will die on this hill. You also had Jose Canseco, the AL MVP, in this game, too, with his with the 40-40 season, which Shohei Itani eclipsed this year with the 50-50 season. So, you have high drama going on. You have a runner on first, Anthony Davis, I believe it was, uh, don't quote me on that. But it's funny because Eckersley admits they were teammates. Davis and him were teammates at one point, and they were good friends. He got a walk, which was unheard of for Eckersley to walk anyone. Eckersley walked him with two outs in the inning. First two outs, boom, boom, done. It looked like, you know, wrap it up, send it to Cooperstown, this game is over. 
As I said, Gibson comes out of the dugout to a thunderous applause. Now he's in the on deck circle. He had, you know, he's just taking practice swings in the on deck circle as like a decoy. Gets the walk. There he goes up to the plate. You're like, okay, you're really rolling the dice now. The guy can't run. If he hits a ground ball, this game is over. He can't run. So Gibson battles. Eckersley gets him to a two-strike count. Gibson battles. Foul ball, foul ball, ball, ball. Gets him to a full count. And in interviews afterwards, in interviews for the last 36 years, Gibson has said he was looking for that back foot slider. Back foot slider, back foot slider. He gets the full count, and the book was that Eckersley throws a back foot slider on a full count. Guess what Eckersley threw? A back foot slider. Guess where it went? Over the right field wall. And if you ever watch the video, it's hysterical because you see one car. Well, you see several cars. But there's one car in particular you'll see. And go watch this. You'll see it. That when he hits the ball, you see the, the brake lights come on this car as the ball is sailing over the fence. It's a hysterical view to see. You just see this one guy, one person in this car going, why the hell did I leave? You missed it. But that's right. Today is also the day of the Kirk Gibson home run. Now that's a ticket from game one. You can see autographed by Kirk Gibson up on top there, right there. And that is Dennis Eckersley. Dennis Eckersley's autograph right there, if I can ever get my finger over there. Right there. And then Kirk Gibson inscribed Game 1, 1988 World Series walk-off home run. It was one of the most incredible sporting days I can remember. Just because you had two such two significant events happen within a span of eight hours of each other on the same day. And being in my... Uh, how can I put this? Prime drinky days. <laughs> a good time was had by all. But I sat in a bar, even though I shouldn't have been, and was just stunned going, did I just see what I think I saw? Yes, I did see what I thought I saw. And it was an incredible day. I had to share both of these since they happened on the same day. Now, I'm also going to throw one more in here because it's my show and I can do whatever the hell I want. October 16th, 2005, something happened that, sadly, we may never see in our lifetime again. The White Sox win the AL pennant. This is a ticket from get that game, which was game five of the ALCS in 2005. Autographed by Jose Contreras. As you can see, he inscribed complete game AL champs October 16th, 2005. The amazing, many amazing things about this was that was probably the moment that brought me the most joy. And I'm going to say this for entirely selfish, petty, stupid reasons now looking back, but then it meant a lot. You had one up on the Cubs. All I heard for two fucking years was how the Cubs got five outs from the World Series. The Cubs got five outs from the World Series. So when the White Sox went into the ninth inning, three outs from the World Series, you bet your ass there were a couple people that I called because texting didn't exist really back then. It did in a way, but it wasn't as easy as it is now. On my Palm Pilot, I had, that's what I had. I had that, no, a handspring, sorry. It was a handspring. So, needless to say, I was making phone calls to people. We're three outs away, we're two outs away, we're one out away. Fuck you, we're going to the World Series. I can't tell you the joy it brought me. Just going to the World Series. Following weekend, October 22nd, October 23rd, one of the greatest weekends of my life because I got to go to both games. Yes, I got to go to both games. And I will say this. Walking out after game two, after Pesetnik hit the home run. Funny story about that. First, I will argue that it was louder when Canerco hit the grand slam than when Pesetnik walked it off. And I'll explain my rationale why I think that was. You expect, a, you know, you expect uh, Canerco to do something. And that home run was just majestic. It was fabulous. It was wonderful. They took the lead. It was incredible. The bottom of the ninth with them tied, because remember, they tied it up in the top of the ninth off of Jenks. And Ozzie Guillen gives the great 
you know, you see the great sight of Ozzy cheering up Jenks as they're coming off in the top of the ninth after the inning finished. You see that, and you you see what's happening. Now, I was with someone at the time. If I would have known what happened a couple months later, I wouldn't have been with that someone. I would have probably sold the ticket and made a shitload of money, but whatever. I was with someone at the time, and I turned to her, and I said, Uribe, who let off the inning, Pacetic was the second batter, Uribe, who let off the inning, was going to hit a home run and end the game. Uribe hit one to the warning track, so I was a little wrong on that. Little did I know, here comes Scott Pesednik, and over the wall it goes. And I think the reason Canerco's cheers were louder than when Pesednik hit the home run, because people were in fucking shock that Pesednik hit that home run. Just had to throw that out there. But I had to share that. You know, I had to share October 15th. I figured I'd throw in October 16th uh, and then talk about the next weekend. And then, of course, October 26, 2005, the greatest night in Chicago sports history. Fuck you, Cub fans. All right. That's it for me. I'm out of here. Have a good night, everyone. Go Bears. <laughs>